Welcome back. This is AP Environmental Science, and we're in Chapter 3 talking about how matter cycles through ecosystems. And today we're going to talk about one of the more complex uh, cycles of matter, and that is the nitrogen cycle. And I really encourage you to go to your textbook and read this section uh, several different times to get all the uh, details of this cycle. It's a very important cycle for living things, and so please spend time on this cycle. It's also one cycle in environmental science that we visit many different times throughout the course and so be sure to really understand this cycle. This is figure 3.12 in your book and this is how I'm going to describe some of the general processes of uh, nitrogen cycling through an eco ecosystem. And so atmospheric nitrogen uh, is in the form of N2, and N2 is just two nitrogens bound together with a, a very strong bond. And so N2, this atmospheric nitrogen, is actually about 78% of our atmosphere. So every breath you take is mostly uh, nitrogen. And so uh, this form, this atmospheric nitrogen, is not a usable form. We can't actually use N2. Uh, to build amino acids and uh, proteins and such that we need in our bodies. 3% of your body about is uh, nitrogen, but we don't get it from atmospheric nitrogen uh, directly. And so we need some way to fix this nitrogen so that we can actually use it. And so this is the process, this process you see here is um, taking atmospheric nitrogen, fixing it to a usable form, and then uh, the process of it getting back into the atmosphere, this cycle of matter. So the first thing is we need to fix the nitrogen. We need to take N2, we need to fix it to a usable form. N2 is not a usable form for living, uh, most living organisms. And so we need to fix this. Well, there are some living organisms that can fix nitrogen mainly uh, bacteria. So there's bacteria that are uh, closely or, or in the root systems of different plants, beans and uh, some types of trees and um, uh, I'm blanking beans and peas and that sort of thing. So these nitrogen fixing bacteria uh, are able to and cyanobacteria is also a nitrogen-fixing bacteria, are able to use a special enzyme to break down this nitrogen into, into a usable form, that being ammonia. And so these bacteria, they use a special enzyme, they break it, they are able to get it into a usable form, they use it for themselves, but then any uh, part of that that they don't use, they excrete it as waste, into the soil as you see here. That then quickly moves to another form, ammonium, which is uh, usable as well. The bacteria that are near the roots, basically the bacteria near the roots of plants, uh, excrete the excess ammonia. The plants are able to assimilate this into their tissues. And then the plant provides the bacteria nutrients and, and sugars to survive. So this is very important to understand. Now it's in a usable form and the producers or plants on land can uh, now build their tissues like they need to and now that usable nitrogen is in the tissues of plants. Consumers are then going to eat this, the plant life, and uh, are then able to assimilate that into their own tissues. And now these consumers have the proper amount of nitrogen in their uh, living tissues as well. Uh, another way that uh, we get usable nitrogen into the soil is decomposers that eat consumers after they die are going to then also excrete excess uh, um, ammonium that they get from the consumers into the soil. Uh, and that's called um, ammonification. We also have uh, another type of uh, 
process, this step four, nitrification. And this is where bacteria in the ground uh, take the ammonium and it is then converted into nitrite and also nitrate. And so these are negative ions and uh, this is going to be an intermediate step to this final step, denitrification, in which deep and stagnant water and soils where there's little oxygen, bacteria are going to convert this nitrite and nitrate to nitrous oxide and then ultimately back to uh, atmospheric nitrogen. So that's sort of the cycle here. It's easy uh, five steps down here, but there's a lot that's taking place in those five steps. Oh, I forgot one thing. Uh, not only bacteria fix nitrogen, but you must note that industry fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere and we can make uh, fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers. And uh, this is a very, it takes a lot of energy to do. So it requires a lot of energy. And then lightning also fixes a lot of atmospheric uh, nitrogen that then is rained down to the earth and, and plants can use that fixed nitrogen as well. In fact, lightning is very important in this process. And so that is uh, basically the, the general idea behind nitrogen cycle and very important. Uh, it's important for living things for them to continue to live and, and have the basic building blocks of life. Uh, there. Nitrogen is considered what we call limiting uh, reagent or uh, a limiting um, nutrient. And so what this means is oftentimes uh, living things uh, don't have enough of it, right? So uh, there's a lack of nitrogen and this constrains the growth of a producer. And so uh, it's considered a limiting nutrient. However, sometimes uh, excess from runoff on land and such can go in the waterways and give uh, excess inputs of nitrogen. And this is going to have consequences for the ecosystem. So as uh, if we use too much industrial fertilizers with nitrogen, this inputs more nitrogen into an ecosystem than we should have. This then is going to run off into marine systems and freshwater systems. And now those systems are, instead of having a, a limitation of nitrogen, they have excess. And this is really going to alter the distribution and abundance of species in those ecosystems. And so this has happened, and, and nitrogen uh, can have a, a very strong effect on ecosystems and, and causing changes of biodiversity in ecosystems. So that is the nitrogen cycle. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, phosphorus cycle, which is a little bit easier. I'll shrink this down if I can. Um, so the phosphorus cycle is a little bit uh, simpler to understand. Again, uh, read it, read the chapter, and pay close attention to the uh, the figure in the book, which is this figure uh, right here. And so phosphorus, phosphorus, one thing that you should understand, different than nitrogen, has no gaseous state. And so phosphorus is all moving on the ground and in the water systems and that sort of thing. And so uh, phosphorus, again, is an important part to living systems in order for you to uh, have enough um, phosphorus is a major component of DNA and RNA and ATP and such. And so phosphorus is very important for living systems. And so it moves around on land and through waterways and it as well as a limiting nutrient. And so uh, phosphorus is going to uh, be able to uh, accumulate in rocks that have ultimately accumulated and then uplifted from the ocean floor. And so as phosphorus gets in waterways uh, in the form of phosphate, it's going to uh, basically precipitate out of the solution, form a sediment down on the bottom of the ocean, and ultimately over unbelievable amounts of time, millions, billions of years, it's going to uplift on uh, the mountaintops. So now you're going to have phosphate rocks in the mountaintops. 
when it rains down, this is going to move some of that phosphate uh, down off of runoff back into the ocean where that process can start up again onto uh, living systems where it can then be included and uh, eaten by animals and, and used by plants and that sort of thing. This is going to then be able to use by animals and plants, but as they excrete waste, it's going to again run off into waterways and back into the ocean where you can have this build up on the, the marine floor that will ultimately again come back up to phosphate rocks. This also happens in the ocean. Phosphate's taken up by consumers and plants. They decompose on the bottom of the ocean and marine areas where sediments build up and ultimately will go back up as rock. Uh, so this is sort of a, a basic, pretty easily understood uh, cycle. We have, through um, different ways, including uh, agriculture, which you see here, and then also residential lands, have now started to input more phosphate than should be in a, in a water system. Again, it's a limiting nutrient, but when we add more input, now these organisms can thrive and it can be, become uh, quite a problem. So detergents, laundry detergents from residential areas ha have had phosphates in the past until they've finally in the 90s and in uh, 2010, the phosphates were made illegal in terms of laundry detergents. And so before though, these laundry detergents would go in waterways Phosphates from fertilizers in agricultural line, uh, land would go into the waterways. And what would you would have is an algal balloon. So now you have excess phosphates in the marine system. You'd have al uh, algae just uh, grow unbelievably, rapid growth of algae. And then this biomass would then die quickly, really quickly. And then it would be decomposed by bacteria and other things. Well, when it's being decomposed, what happens is the oxygen in the water would be used up. And so what you have is a hypoxic or a low oxygen uh, situation, which means that all other life in the area die because there's no oxygen. So this excess of phosphorus has created what we call dead zones. Uh, in places like the Mississippi River and literally where the river comes out and you have algal blooms and then decomposition of the algae, low oxygen or hypoxic environment and then a complete dead zone, what we call a dead zone, uh, occur. No, no life in that area. So that's the phosphate or the phosphorus cycle. And so, uh, again, read this, go over it. This one's a little bit more basic, and I can answer questions later.